Let's go to our guests in London. I'm joined by Mike Galsworthy, the co-founder of Scientists for EU, and Robert Alls, who's the director of the Bruges Group, a pro-Brexit organization. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on The Newsmakers. Mike, two years on, this is looking like a very ugly divorce. They're fighting over the kids and all sorts of things. Do you want another referendum, just like Sadiq Khan? Uh, yeah, I think it's actually going to be necessary. Initially, I didn't. Initially, at Scientists for EU, our responsibility after the vote was to make a plan for UK and EU science after Brexit. And so that's what I did, and I put it to the government and uh, published it elsewhere. But uh, as time went on, I was always supportive of those people who said that if it really becomes messy, if it really becomes something that the public doesn't want, and if it starts falling apart, then the public always have the right to pull the plug on it and to say, this isn't what we want anymore. And the current situation is this. Our government have put a broken checkers plan before the EU that doesn't even have parliamentary support back home. Those that would like to replace it don't even have a plan to replace it with. And so we're in a hell of a mess with time running out and more and more people are interested in exactly what you're saying, another vote to reassess where we are. OK, Robert, uh, we have YouGov polls suggesting that it's not just Mike, but you have many others who might have even voted for Brexit, experiencing some buyer's remorse. In a democracy, why not give it another go two years on? Well, the numbers have hardly moved since the referendum and there was opinion polls, most opinion polls since the referendum date have supported leaving the European Union. And it's not just a matter of the referendum that was two years ago now. There was the overwhelming support behind that referendum, the Act of Parliament that created that referendum, the manifesto commitments to have a referendum on the European Union. A general election has since taken place in 2017 where 80% of the MPs were elected on manifestos of leaving the European Union, and actually not only that, but also taking us out of the single market and the customs union. That has all been approved. The government has got the power, have been given the power by Parliament to take us out of the European Union and negotiate an exit. This is the biggest mandate in British political history in terms mm -hmm. of a referendum and, of course, the overwhelming support. But you've still got people who are trying to really change the vote of the last referendum. That's the real aim. And we just need to get on and move forward and take Britain out of the European Union as the general elections has proved and, of course, as the referendum has delivered. Okay. We need to move forward now. And all this is just delaying and not actually forming the new future that Britain should have outside of the EU. It's just a delaying tactic and actually weakening Britain's negotiating hand in Brussels. OK. Mike, I want, I want you to have a, a listen to Michael Gove, who responded to the Mayor of London's call for a new referendum. Have a little listen to Michael Gove. I felt it was, it was interesting and troubling that he wants essentially to frustrate the vote that we had two and a half years ago. People voted clearly. 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union. And Sadiq is essentially saying, stop, let's delay that whole process, let's throw it into chaos. And I think that would be a profound mistake. OK, so, Mike, there you have the Environment Secretary basically saying what Robert's saying as well. Sadiq Khan and you and others yep. want to frustrate democracy. You have a contempt for democracy. How many more times do you want to have a spin of the wheel until you get the right answer? They feel the people have spoken. It was free and fair. Get on with it. Ah, so the people have spoken. Right. So here's one of the most amusing myths, that, that Ramones are somehow frustrating the process and blocking things up. We're not. We're just watching it from the sidelines. We're getting alarmed and saying, if it all goes to the wall, we need a backup plan in order to ditch the mess. So the Ramonas, the Remainers have had no say in this. The Brexiteers themselves who've been driving this project cannot agree on a plan. Let me repeat, the Brexiteers who've been driving this process cannot agree on a plan. Even those that want to ditch checkers and form their own alternative plan can't come up with a plan. They wrote a plan and then they decided to shelve that plan. So it doesn't matter who's driving the bus or the fact that you want to drive a bus. 
distance. If you don't know where you're going and the steering wheel is broken, you're not going to get very far. So the Ramonas, the Remainers, you know, have nothing to do with frustrating the process. It's the people who want Brexit themselves that are frustrating each other and fighting like ferrets in a sack and getting us nowhere. It's us, the responsible ones, who are saying, right, let's build a path out of this. If, and your plan if to keep they us can't in deliver European something that is acceptable vote, to the public. So oh, okay, so why don't come you in, Robert. forward your plan about how we'd go forward? But actually, your real plan is to have another vote to try and keep us in the European Union. That's your plan, the same old plan, the previous idea of having Britain in the EU. That idea failed. That was rejected by the British people. If you have so much to contribute, what's your idea for Britain being outside of the European Union? How would you help us? take this project forward. You have nothing to say about that because your answer is join the EU. That's gone. That bus has certainly left a long time ago. So you need to move forward, move on with your life and move on with looking forward with how Britain can take Brexit to the next level and how Britain can be a success outside Allow the Allow me to address this. Go ahead. I began by saying immediately after the referendum, I, as a scientist, specialist in science policy, wrote a plan for UK and EU science after Brexit. It was called an eight-point plan for UK and EU science after Brexit. I put out a whole series of proposals, which the government are now largely acting upon, about how you would do that after Brexit. My preference would have been a soft Brexit within EFTA, working on something like that. But that's not what happened. Our government have hit a brick wall. And like I said, I always said there should be a backup that if it does go to the wall, if it doesn't have the popular support, then we back up from the dead end and find our route out. Now, if you want Brexit, it's fine, you know, Brexit in principle. It's got these great ideas. But if you can't make it work, then you need to shelve the thing and come back another day when you actually do have a plan, a nice written plan that the public can actually support. It's very simple. It's like with any project. You start it. If it starts going wrong, you need to have a, an ability to just shift it. OK. Robert, we can't, we can't actually hear you when he's talking because you're on Skype and he's via satellite. So let's give him a chance and then you come in afterwards. So finish your point, Mike. OK, so the point is 90% of growth and trade happening outside the EU. OK, fantastic, great. We want in on that. And the question then becomes, do we want in on that as a solo country of 65 million, or do we want in on that as a team of 28 countries with a population over half a billion, all holding up the standards that we have agreed together over the last 40 years. The latter has a lot more power. So it doesn't matter that 90% of the growth is happening outside the EU. In fact, if you think about the whole galaxy or the whole universe, that's where all the growth is going to happen. But that is not an argument for leaving the EU, because the argument is when you want to do new trade deals with where you see growth happening, do you want to do it solo or do you want to do it as a bigger team? That's Robert. the fundamental question, okay. and we can debate that. Go ahead, Robert. It's, it's, that is very easily answered because the European Union does not have a free trade deal with countries such as China and India, where growth is happening. The countries in Europe that do have trade deals with China are outside of the European Union. Evidence proves that Switzerland, through its free trade deals made separate to the European Union, have experienced greater growth, right. greater but, increases in but trade Robert, as well in its deal but Robert, than one those made countries, Robert. You, you, Robert, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, Robert, 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 you mentioned China and India. Those countries don't have to untangle any existing deals that are, that are integral to their economies right now, which is what the UK has to do with Brexit, right? So isn't that a false analogy? The, the analogy is quite clearly that the growth is happening outside of the European Union, so we need to be making links with other countries around the world, not having our trade policy dictated by the European Union, which holds up Britain's interest. Trade policy for the UK currently has tariffs on oranges. We do not produce oranges within the UK. This is set to fit with Spanish standards. It does not act in our interest. It would be in the UK's interest to have freer trade in agricultural produce. We would then be able to persuade countries like India to enter into a free trade agreement with us. However, because the European Union is protectionist, increasing prices for consumers and protecting Ag big agricultural industries, basically within France and Germany, we are then not in a position to set our own trade agreements. We are not in a position to negotiate trade agreements with a very beneficial force. So negotiating as part of the bloc of the European Union has been proven to 
not be working in Britain's interest to make consumer prices far more higher than what they should be above market rates for the rest of the world. And, of course, has meant we can't tap into new markets because it restricts our trade agreements. And, of course, it doesn't make trade agreements within services. And Britain's strong strength are in the service industry. So, again, you know, your previous guest, Mr Goldsworthy, doesn't actually understand how trade works, doesn't understand how being in that block with the European Union isn't in the UK's interest. It has not delivered where we want it to deliver. It has not created these tradings. So we think we'll be better off going out, doing these deals ourselves, as Switzerland has proved to be successful. Okay. And we'll be working with other nations around the world where our interests align, not just having our interests dictated to by the Commission of the European Union, which is unelected, and the European Commissioner for Trade is a Swedish okay. lady. Okay. We, Fair we, enough, Robert. Name, name okay, Ro Robert. Okay, let's bring in Mike. Mike, have a nibble. Have a nibble. Okay, thank you very much. For a start, the EU actually has more trade deals than does Switzerland. It has more trade deals than does the US, than does China, and so forth and so on. It is a very, very effective trade platform for the UK and has been opening up the rest of the world. It has more trade capacity than we do alone, and so it will reach global saturation faster than we will alone. And in terms of this notion that the EU is protectionist, that gets peddled out a lot. The EU has got lower average tariff barriers than does the US. The EU also has a um, special deal with the 40... Nine poorest countries in the world through the Everything But Arms Agreement, which means that we have zero tariff barriers on, on 33 African countries, for example. So the EU is actually doing extraordinarily well in trade at the moment, and we have benefited from that, and we can continue to benefit from that. If you think that the UK can do better trade deals that are more specialist to the UK alone, OK, fine. But you have to understand that we are stepping down from a platform of over 50 free trade deals plus beyond free trade deals, there's a myriad of side deals that goes with those, we step out of that framework and we start from scratch. This is like jumping off a bus, taking a tumble, and then think that you can run faster than the bus and overtake it. Robert? Again, again this is factually incorrect. Britain can have those trade deals because they're, they're mixed agreements, and Britain all it needs to do is have the agreement of the third party, so that's Chile or South Korea, lodge that agreement with the United Nations, and that trade agreement would apply to the UK. But we would not United be starting Nations. from scratch. Mike Goldsworthy, yeah, that's, where, that's, where, that's where international treaties are lodged. If you knew about trade, you would be able to, you would know that. You wouldn't be confused by that quite simple point. I was just explaining how international trade agreements work and we wouldn't be starting from scratch. We can bank those agreements and move forward. That's where we will be taking Britain. We'd be having those particular agreements that would apply to the UK once we leave the European Union and negotiating new ones as well and we would be possibly doing a lot better job. And that's what the British people have asked to do. We want to trade globally. The European Union has restrictions. And you should really know the European Union's common agricultural policy actually harms developing nations. It rises, increases food costs for people with inside the European Union and actually is very protectionist and doesn't actually give access to the European market for developing nations is what they need and would actually benefit us at the same time. It would be a win for us okay. and it would be a win for developing okay, nations Robert, if we I've got to wrap. ended the European okay. Common Agriculture. I've, I've, got, I've got to wrap, but Mike, I want to give you 20 seconds, please, to, to finally respond and, and wrap us up. Go ahead, Mike. OK, um, we, we had a nice little diversion on to trade there, but uh, regardless of all of that, that's all fantasy land that we can't get to unless we have the parliamentary arithmetic to actually strike a deal that Parliament agrees to and the wider public will support. And that is where we are stuck. And if we are stuck there, then we really do need to think about using the reverse gear if we have hit that brick wall. OK, we'll be keeping... A close eye on the House of Commons, Theresa May selling her Brexit deal on Salzburg. The thing I was most worried about when I was doing my reading for this segment was that I'm reading that Cadbury's is hoarding chocolate. And I find that a crime against humanity. So there you go. Well, we'll be keeping a close eye on all of this until March 29th. Six months to go. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. Mike Goldsworthy and Robert Thanks Dawes. very much. Bye-bye.